welcome everybody. I'm going to make a really short introduction because we're starting late. And um, Dan Lear, who is with us here today, is going to tell you all about um, AVO and why it's called that, maybe. And But just to give a brief background, he was an associate at a couple different law firms, and then he decided to um, fight the entrepreneur um, bullet and jump ship. In the meantime, though, when he was still at his law firm, he um, did a lot of entrepreneurial things, including developing, co-founding the Seattle um, meetups, which got a whole bunch of attorneys that are interested in technology and changing the legal marketplace together. He's done a lot of other entrepreneurial things, including being involved with the Startup Day in Seattle. And now he is working at Avo and is um, part of a new landscape that he's going to talk about. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So that whole fiasco that you just saw with the technology, uh, you can, like, that's going to completely discount anything, any cred that I have as a technologist, <laughs> because I can't get Keynote working. Uh, so thank you, Michelle. Uh, really great to be here. Um, so I, uh, as Michelle mentioned, I'm, my name is Dan. I'm the Director of Industry Relations for AVO. We'll talk a little bit about what, what that means and what I do. Um, I have, over the last year and even more so, probably counting beyond that, I've probably given, I don't know, 50 or 60 presentations on a wide variety of topics, mostly related to law and technology. Uh, but rarely do I get asked, uh, and, and Nathan asked me to talk about myself, partly, and, and how I got here, and also talk about Avo. And it's remarkably hard to prepare a presentation about yourself, because everything, I think everything that I've done is really interesting. Uh, but having a little bit of perspective on uh, whether anyone else would think that is interesting is really challenging. Uh, and then similarly, when I was exchanging email and talking with, with Michelle about this, uh, she really underscored the importance of, of giving you folks a chance to, to ask questions and, and really have a discussion. And frankly, I feel like in an academic setting, particularly in a law school, particularly in this law school, uh, having more Q&A and having more of an interactive dialogue would be a lot more valuable and a lot more interesting. Or maybe you guys are on the other side of the fence where you'd like, you're like, we've been getting questions all day. Uh, I'd rather just have you talk and entertain us and don't, don't ask me to say anything. So, so here, I, I structured my presentation in kind of an interesting way. Uh, I just want to blast you through a few slides. And here, I'll even give you the quick, uh, um, oops, that went too fast. There we go. Okay. There there we go, technology. Oh, yeah, we made we thought we solved it. There we go. Uh, I want to talk quickly just about me, uh, then about AVO, then about where we're going uh, into the future. I'll try to tie it all together. And then my theory is I would just open it up for Q&A. And, and my, I'm, my thinking is that this is going to take all of maybe uh, 10, maybe 15 minutes. So we'll have a lot of time for, question, time for questions and answers. Uh, if it turns out that you're really a tough crowd and would just rather I continue to talk, I have more content because, I, I, again, uh, one of the hard things about presenting is, is this sort of balance between too much and too little. Uh, so just in the event that I got to 20 after and it was like crickets in here, I can still do this for a few minutes just to keep you entertained. So let's get started. About me. Uh, Michelle already gave you my background. I'm a lawyer. I practiced law for eight years. And now I do technology evangelism for AVO. And I'll talk about AVO in a minute. What does that look like? What, is, what do I do day to day? I give talks like this. I've talked with lawyers, with uh, law, law school students, with judges, with court staff all throughout the country. I write a bunch. Uh, as you can see, I've, I've written in the ABA Journal, I write for local legal publications, I write for national legal publications, uh, and I just try to really, I am, our, I am Avo's ground game, is the way that we think about it. I'm out, boots on the ground, talking to lawyers, spreading the word. It's not, when you think about it from a startup perspective or from a business perspective, it's not a very scalable activity, but developing those relationships getting to know people, shaking their hands, being physically in places 
despite everything Michelle will tell you about the fabulous things she does in Law Without Walls, sometimes it is good to actually meet people face to face, shake their hands, and get to know them. How did I get here? Well, this is a much longer part that I will, I will delve into, again, if, uh, if you don't have any questions after I sort of blast through this short uh, introduction. But basically, I was a lawyer and I decided I was miserable practicing law. I was a technology lawyer. Um, and, and honestly, where this partly came from is I couldn't believe the way that we did so many things that we did in law. And I knew enough about technology not to be helpful, as you could see, but enough to be dangerous. And so I decided to try to marry those two. And I just started blogging, I started writing, I started looking for opportunities to talk about it. And I, again, if we get into it, I'll, I'll give you more detail. But one thing led to another. Uh, Avo happened to be based in Seattle, which is where I'm also based. And I was able to connect with them and, and they, actually I initially pitched them on a consulting gig and they turned around to me and said, hey, we're actually looking to hire someone that looks a lot like you, what do you think? So I've been doing that for about a year and some. And now I get paid to really do what I think fits me really well and, and what I love. So now I'll talk about Avo for a minute. And, Again, it's, it's tricky with a law school crowd, too, because you guys, maybe you don't think about these things yet. Maybe you're happily buried in your contracts, textbooks. Uh, has, has anyone ever heard of Avo? Maybe you've seen the TV, maybe you've seen the TV ads. <laughs> oh, whoops, this is not working. All right, so am I seeing like 50%-ish, kind of? Okay, some. So we are an online legal marketplace. We help consumers find a lawyer and get legal information, and we help lawyers find clients. How do we help people find a lawyer? So we have profiles for 97% uh, of all the lawyers in the country. And we give them a rating. And that makes them grumpy, sometimes. They're getting over it. It made them grumpy originally. They're getting over it. We also collect client review scores on the lawyers. Just like Can Yelp. Can you just say, how do you sure. give them a rating? Absolutely. Oh, I'd love to. So the auto rating is, is really sophisticated. Uh, and it takes into account a lot of the same type of content that uh, any lawyer would take into account when they're uh, trying to, say, refer a, a friend or family member out to, to a lawyer. So when, let's say someone came to you, Professor Wilkins, with a resume of an attorney. What kind of information would you look at to determine whether this person would be suitable to uh, to help your friend, your friend and family out? I, I like the Socratic method. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I, it's, it, 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 it takes it. So it's 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 a, it's a simplification of all of that same type of information, right? Yeah, I mean, I want to know where it comes from and what it is, though. Okay, sure. No, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I mean, it's really. It's, it's complex in the sense that it takes in a ton of information, but at the end of the day, it's pretty basic in, in the types of information it takes in. So the first thing it, it considers is, where did you go to law school? Uh, that's obviously a factor. We, we weight that somewhat accordingly. Uh, the second piece is, how long ago did you graduate from law school? So how long have you been in practice? Uh, and, and that's really, the, and there's really, I'll, I'll step back, there's really three components. There's experience discipline and, and what we call industry recognition. So that first piece is where did you go to law school and how long have you been in practice? The second piece is disciplinary information and that's pretty straightforward. If you've been disciplined by a bar association, if you've ever uh, been disbarred, if you've ever been suspended, we can take that into, the, into account. And then the final piece is industry recognition. And that takes in a really wide swath of information. Everything from other rating systems like Martindale Hubble, is that, do people even know about that anymore? Um, to like super lawyers, to best lawyers, to uh, whether you've served in any voluntary or mandatory bar association as either leadership or say a section leader, something like that. If you've been published in any significant bar journals or law journals or even sometimes like the ABA journal or, or local types of publications, it takes that into account. And then a variety of other information. So you have bots crawling publicly available information to produce these, to, to 
to fetch this information by people's name, and then you must have some kind of algorithm that you use to weight them? Yeah, just like Google crawls the web. Right. We crawl the web as well. We take that information in. And obviously the information that we get, and this is great, see this is why I'd much rather answer your questions than like talk about me. Um, the, so we, we build the baseline profiles based off of publicly available data, right? Every bar association has their, that information online except for New Mexico, New Hampshire, Oklahoma, and three others still don't publish their lawyer data online, believe it or not. So we work with them <laughs> to get that data in a format we can consume it. But everyone else publishes it online, so we start with that. Right? And usually that has information about how long that individual has been licensed to practice. So that's the baseline. And then, yeah, from there, just like any number of other web services do, Google being the most prominent example, we crawl the web and we incorporate that information into, and then, yeah, and then we have an algorithm that weights them and spits out a score. And how did you develop the algorithm? Because that's where all the action is, right? Uh, all the action. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, well, yeah. I, mean, I mean, people can look up people who's bar scores, I mean, but the 9.2 is... Oh, so that's, well, you know, so it's, yeah. and it's, so to answer your question, and I've only worked with the company for a year, so I don't have all the gory details about how it all happened, I know how it works, and I have, I've had conversations with the folks who did. Um, honestly, it was just a process of, it, it's a, when you think about what technology can do, is it can take simple human tasks, and it can automate them. And just like you can look at someone's resume, and after a few seconds, depending on a number of different factors of information, you can make some kind of an assessment about their quality to represent someone. The algorithm does exactly that, only it does it on a massive scale and collects huge amounts of information. Yeah, but I mean, and then I'll let you go on. No, 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 please. That's a complete judgment call, right? So sure. it's, not, it's not automating Absolutely. information. Totally. It's actually what gets weighted for. So what gets weighted more, where you went to law school, or how many cases of a certain kind have you done, what gets weighted more if you publish in the ABA yeah. journal, or, I mean, those are the kinds of things that it seems to be give the rating meaning. I, I completely agree, and, and with all due respect, this is exactly the conversation that I have with lawyers throughout the country, mm -hmm. and they get really wrapped around the axles about the AVO rating, right? Like, I know someone down the street from me who has XYZ practice history or you know, is not half the lawyer that my buddy Joe is. And that lawyer down the street has you know, whatever and Joe has a lower rating. There's a number of things that could account for that, but the rating was not made, and this is such a crucial piece, it wasn't made for lawyers. It wasn't made to pad lawyers' egos. The whole point of the AVO rating was to make it easier for consumers in making the decision about who to hire. Before AVO existed, and granted, technology is leveling a lot of these uh, information asymmetries that existed before, but before AVO existed, there was no resource for anyone to compare, really any lawyer, but certainly uh, in a way that was meaningful and, and transparent, it, it didn't exist. So. It, it's not necessarily aimed at, I mean, we as lawyers can get really, as you folks know, you're learning right now, we can get really focused on the details and really focused on the nuance. But the goal is to give consumers more information about making a decision about a lawyer. The other thing we've learned, and this is what's really fascinating, is that consumers, when making a decision about a lawyer, care way more about the client reviews, which are not incorporated into the AVO rating than they do about the rating itself. They want to know, and, and, and in fact, they, they care, and I'll be clear, this is most of our traffic, most of the folks who use our site are consumers, right? Looking for help in consumer-facing areas like divorce, family law, uh, immigration, those types of things, bankruptcy. Those consumers care a great deal more about the client reviews in making a decision about who to hire then they do, they look at the rating and they say, okay, they've got a good rating. Uh, but then the next question is like, will you call me back? How are, are you a jerk to work with? Uh, do you practice, do you, you know, if you're doing family law, you know, how, what's your experience been uh, in your own family? Those kinds of things. That they care way more about that than the rating. Yeah? How 
And there was a hand over here too, right? Or was that just a stretch? Okay, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Go ahead. How often did your client reviews uh, support or disagree with the algorithm? Um, that's a really interesting question. I would. So the client, the. In other words, if yeah, yeah, no, 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 yeah, no. I totally get what you're saying, right? If we say someone's a 10.0. Um, right. So, so the interesting thing about the, yeah, the interesting thing about the client reviews is that they can't be automated. They can't be algorithmized in the sense that. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But my but my point is, uh, you. It's really hard to get a lot of client reviews if you're not being somewhat proactive about doing so, right? Either because. A, there's a lot of people who will come and say negative things about you if they had a bad experience of their own volition. Um, but if they say a bad, if, if a client, I get your point that it's you need a critical mass. For yeah, to exactly. Generate a meaningful number. But if this person has a nine point two, and they right. client reviews, that happens to be me, by the way. But not my client reviews. And there's a hundred client reviews, or yeah. five hundred client reviews, and a bunch of them, you know, eighty percent of them give them two stars. Shouldn't that matter in terms of their AVO rating? Because if, if, the, if the people go on the website care more about the client reviews, shouldn't that somewhat correspond with the new rating? Or be a component of the rating? Sure. So we've, we've, we've contemplated incorporating client reviews into the rating, and it's just, it's, it's been a difficult piece to quantify, honestly, and figure out exactly how we would incorporate it. And honestly, now you're stepping beyond the bounds. I'll just be honest with the bounds of my knowledge about sort of how much we've explored this. I mean, a lot of lawyers say, like, shouldn't we think about win rate, right? Like how often you're successful in court or that kind of thing. But again, like really difficult, particularly say in a, in a criminal matter, if you've been charged with uh, first degree murder and you get off with uh, you know, second degree manslaughter or something, like, is that a win and how do you quantify that? So it, it's a fair question and honestly what I may have to say to you is I'll have to get back to you because I don't know. Um, client, the, the broader I think answer is that client reviews are the laggards. Um, you really do have to get a critical mass for it to be uh, meaningful. Do you solicit these or this is just I mean, are they totally voluntary, or is there any They're, requirement if people use the site or use a lawyer that they have to fill in a client review? I mean, is it Uber-like? And how do you know that? Yeah. Right, right, okay. So, uh, they are, A, they are anonymous. Okay. They are anonymous publicly. They are not necessarily anonymous to us. We have an email address. Uh, you do have to proactively, obviously, come to the site and leave them. Um, we can't, you know, grab them from other places. Uh, and the way that we ensure that they are uh, valid is that we have a dispute process. So if a review goes up and an attorney believes that it's not been left by a, an individual who is a client, they can ask that that review be challenged. We then pull the review down and we go back to the client and we ask the client to document that they were actually uh, a client of that particular attorney. If they are able to document that to our satisfaction, then the review goes back up. If so not, then we'll see A one-way ratchet, right? Because often the problem with Yelp reviews and stuff is it's the restaurant owner playing up right. on I'm five star, I'm the best, you know, that sort of thing. How, how do you guard against that? So obviously from a technological perspective, we can see situations where either all of the reviews are coming from one IP address or there's a mass number of reviews that are uploaded at the same time. Uh, over time, you know, if someone really wants to spend the time to like slowly build up, the, um, although, uh, you know, I think we also have mechanisms built in where uh, uh, competitors can, you know, call into question given reviews. So, yeah, yeah I mean, we, we, we do what we can. So, Dan, one yeah. more question about the ratings, and then we'll no, let you go to your next slide. No, no, no. Um, what percentage of lawyers generally have let lower than an eight? And if you get lower than an eight, why wouldn't you just pull yourself off the, out off the site? Yeah, can you pull yourself off the site? <laughs> the right to be pulled off. Right. The site. So, 
Short answer, no. It's publicly available data. Do you keep the rating up even if they don't want you to use your services? Under, well, use our services is a relative term, right? You are. You are. You said 92%. 97%. Crawling bar practice. <laughs> if you if you have if you are a licensed if you are a licensed attorney, I'm up there. Man. I don't no, care. If you have a bar card, I am. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if you have a bar card, so if you have a bar card, you're up, and your yeah. truth is that your rating is your rating, and it's no, your now for folks you like have. you who aren't in active practice, if I go back, and I don't know if you can see it on mine, right there, right. You can, you can indicate that you're not accepting clients, right? And, and but, you can... But I have to do that. Yeah, you can, right. yeah, that's right. right. So, so actually, and, and to be clear, we do, I will say, we do uh, go out of our way to make sure that judges, when they become judges, we try to turn off their rating okay. because that's a little bit of a different situation. So, so yeah. why don't you go to the next thing of what happens? Okay, now people are rated. Yeah. Now people have uh, client reviews. Okay. How do you make the matches? What is your role in making the matches? Uh, okay, and I actually, let's see, I, w I wasn't going to talk about that, so um, at least not right here. Um, let's well, see, what, what happens? Gonna, you see, you oh, no, I, this is like totally, I have no control here. Okay, um, okay so yeah, so, so here's what happens. Uh, here's how people use our site to find lawyers. Yeah. Uh, there's a number of ways. Uh, until we started advertising online and our brand presence got bigger, uh, there were a couple of ways that people usually came to the site. Well, we are very good at what's called search engine optimization or SEO. So if someone typed, uh, and I won't use your example because <laughs> I can tell that it's an issue. So if someone typed, uh, say, Dan Lear, attorney, if your name, and depending on how uh, unique your name is, it depends on whether they need to tag on the attorney or even your city. But let's say they type Dan Lear, Seattle, into Google. The likelihood, just like link with LinkedIn, uh, that or th that out. your AVO profile will appear on the first page, and it's really critical that they appear on the first page yeah. because, as we know, like somewhere between seventy and eighty percent of uh, searchers never move got, past, the, past the first so page. So your profile so, pops up. That's right. Then the person clicks on the profile. That's right. And then what happens after that? And then if you filled out your profile, they have the ability to contact you. <laughs> On the uh, through the site, either using your email, phone number, address, click to your website. And they could just go straight to you. So how do you make money? How do we make money? Yes. So, uh, and, and let, me, let me just quickly answer another part of your question. So another way that the lawyers get found on the site, uh, increasingly people are typing entire search queries, entire uh, queries, questions into Google. Legal questions. Yeah, legal questions. Or, or, or a question that they don't know happens to be legal related, right? And we have a huge question and answer forum, over 7.5 million questions and answers that are questions that have been asked, asked by consumers and answered by lawyers. So if that, there's a, de there's a decent likelihood that your legal question comes up also on the first page. You click through, you look at that question, and then a lawyer has answered. If you like their answer, you can also go to them and then potentially connect them. Yeah. Um, how do we make money? So the, the main source of our revenue is advertising. Uh, and so, and I don't have a screenshot of it here, but if you went to, oh, let's see. Actually, if you search, that's actually right there on the top. If you search, uh, say, DUI lawyer Cambridge up there, and actually you put Cambridge in over here, and then hit search, you get uh, a result of, just like you would get with a search engine, you'd get a list of attorneys um, who meet that search criteria, and that's based off of an internal, internal algorithm that we built, just like Google that places those people accordingly. And then just like a web search does, uh, we sell advertising along the top and along the side. I got you. So okay. people buy to get placement with certain searches. So right now it's an advertising revenue driven model. That's right, yeah. And, yeah. and, and if you searched in DUI Cambridge, yep. the order in which those names were appeared is based on what? It's based off of a number of different factors how close you are to, how close the lawyer is to the geographic region where the individual has searched proximity, that's right, the AVO rating, okay. client review scores. Uh, you can also indicate, you can't see it up here, but you actually, well, you can kind of see it. We have down below on the website, like right here, there's a, a pie chart where you in, that will indicate uh, your 
practice percentages. So let's say I do 50% family law, a quarter DUI, right? We're not going to return somebody who's a family law lawyer for a DUI search, right? So. And that pie chart, that's self-reported? Yeah, self-reported. That's right. So do people, can people pay to be higher up in the list? They, uh, except that they can buy advertising? They can buy no. Advertising, but they can't pay to They be cannot pay to be higher. Like can yeah. they pay to be taken off? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sensing a theme here. I'm sensing a theme here. No, they cannot. Yeah, right. And so that's why you want to advertise to people that you have a complete list of all the lawyers. And people don't pay any, and lawyers don't pay, even if you self-report, lawyers don't pay any money to self-report? No, you can sign up and claim your profile absolutely for free. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep, I have this profile that's got my picture and a bunch of my information. I, I, all of pays me, in fact. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> and then when people use lawyers who are on your site, there's no, you don't have any, you don't play any role, in other words, other than providing like a yellow, a better yellow pages. We make them out. people, right. right. You don't make the match. We, you just provide we, fa the we facilitate the connection. Yeah, sure. Yeah, in other words, you just provide yeah. the plan. But after that, you're totally out of it. That's right. And if people have not yet sued you saying you had a 9.2 rating for a lawyer. Oh, lawyer. well, again, uh, we want to. Yeah. Oh, see, now this doesn't work. I'm oh, sure oops. you have some disclaimer. I was going to say. Going to oh, come on. Oh, I'm stuck <laughs> on the hair and slide. This is awkward. There we go. Uh, oh, come on. I got a point right out. Okay, no worries. Oh, that's right. I was just. Uh, yeah. Okay. As you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> but these are these are. That's our general counsel. You're being sued by lawyers claiming yeah. the ratings are bad. Uh, <laughs> it's a false review. Um, right. My right. competitor wrote this review. My competitor is cheating. You yeah. name it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, go flip back here. Who do you see as your main um, competitor? Mm. In the in the let's see, that's a great question. In the legal marketing space, well, I mean, when we started, yellow pages, right? It was a one billion dollar industry or two billion dollar industry, and it was a, a paper book that landed on your porch. Right. Uh, there, yeah. The, increasingly, there's there's really no one that's operating at the scale that we are, particularly in this fashion. Um, you know, I could trot out the, the traditional sort of like find law, which is a Westlaw um, tool, uh, lawyers.com at one point, although they're sort of flagging. Um, Rocket Lawyer is probably a decent competitor. And, and increasingly, as LegalZoom turns and, right. and embraces lawyers, uh, they look a lot like a competitor of ours. Right. Um, but they're all doing stuff that you're not doing. So I'm curious, you said the third bullet point so if, have we captured kind of what the, how the system works right now? Because your next bullet point was where you see it going in the future. Yeah. yeah. And I'd love you to have sure. a chance to talk about that. So, Dan, can you oh. talk a little bit about the Q&A? Oh, hey, Adam. Hey, okay. <laughs> Maybe real quick, I'm interested in yeah. how the Q&A piece works. Yeah. Sure, that's, that's, what I was, that's where I was going. So, okay, great. Um, and, and you guys just jump in and ask questions. I was, again, this was going to be the quick blast through, but I'm super glad you're asking questions, because again, I'd way rather have it be this way. Um, so you can ask a question on everything relating to from a custody right to uh, a hair in my food, right? These are the kinds of questions we get. The questions are submitted anonymously, and then lawyers who have claimed their profile on our site, they don't have to pay, but you have to be a participating active member on the site, can come and answer the questions. Okay. Okay. It's, right. it's pretty much that. It's, it's really that simple. And that's the way that we make sure that the people who are answering the questions are actually lawyers as opposed to just some random person. Is that good enough? Yeah, and so can you show us an answer? Yeah, oh, I didn't know. I just threw the questions up there because, again, I was just trying to blast through this. But, and and yeah. the attorneys then answer, and you just show the answers in the order in which they come in, or do you sort the answers? They do. I think they do get they, – it's not an algorithm if they get – so you as an attorney can also go through and agree with other people's answers. Uh -huh. So I do believe that – I believe, and this is where I – you know, if you're really concerned about it, we can sync up after. I'll have to yeah. find out. I think upvoted answers may move to the top, okay. uh, but usually it's just based off of uh, time, the timeline. And then presumably they put their name and their contact information so that if the person 
There's a link to there's a link and that's exactly gets to there's a link to your Avo profile. So if someone likes your answer, then you can just jump in. Then you click on the profiles. And are you tracking this at all? Absolutely. Yep. You're tracking, in other words, how many people, uh, how many answers get clicked on to the profile. Ooh, that's a, you're not yeah. following anything more than that. But is, do you have any feedback mechanism back to whether people actually get hired and get work? No, no. We know how many contacts we send to yeah. lawyers every every month, uh, but we don't know how many of those get. And and we've made some estimates based off of sort of close rates that we know um, from industry wide as well as other lawyers that we work with and talk to. But no, we don't we don't have a real good sense of that. And do you, um, you must know how many attorneys that ones that are active, unlike me. On your site, um, <laughs> what percentage of them are solo attorneys? What percentage of them are of law firms of two to three people? What percentage of them do virtual law? Like you, we do. We do know that we don't. We don't do anything special as it relates to the consumer or how they show up on the site as a real, result of that. But we do know that because, and it's self-reported, right? They tell us what size of firm they practice in. But. So you ask them a series of questions, some of which show up on the site, but some of which are for your purpose. Uh, no, I think we would. I, what I'm saying is, you don't get preference. It, it doesn't come into. No, 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 not it's not preferential treatment. I'm yeah. wondering. In other words, if I want to sign up on your site, if you want to claim your, account. you don't claim on my right. I'm on. Your site. <laughs> Thank you. you should, do you want to do marketing for us? Yeah. So if I want to claim my account, do you send me a questionnaire that I have to fill out? You can do it right on the site. You can also import your LinkedIn profile. There's there's a certain amount of information that's required and other that's optional. So and I would imagine that a firm side is an optional size is an optional question. Okay. Doesn't is there anything you have to give us, but it is data that we know to some extent. Okay. So so that's how this works. Anything yep. else more on this questions and answers, so I talked about that already. And then a product that we rolled out late last year is Avo Advisor, okay. which is basically on demand legal advice. So it's a free download right now. We're only in iOS, uh, but we hope to be soon in Android. So you download for free, and I just was going to quickly, quickly walk you guys through a demo yeah. so you can see it's really easy. You open it up. This is the first screen you see. It says start a session. You hit start a session, and you get uh, a list of uh, practice areas. So bankruptcy, business, and hopefully in uh, plain English or, or more intelligible English, because again, this is aimed at consumers, not lawyers. You pick one of those, in this case I chose business, you put your information in, your phone number, and the state that you're in, you hit next. Uh, and one slide I skipped over, which may be interesting to folks, is uh, you can also um, put in a picture. So if you've got, say, an immigration notice, or a lease, or something that you want, or you know, maybe you've got some huge gash on your leg, probably better for a doctor, but still. Um, you, can, you, can, you can send a picture. You put in your credit card information, you hit agree and get a call, and usually in about 10 minutes, an attorney will call you back, uh, and for $40, you can talk to that attorney for 15 minutes. So where does that attorney come from, and what role do you play if any in who that is? So we have been recruiting attorneys specifically for this program. Okay. We choose them based off of a variety of factors. A lot of the same things that go into what, how, how you would place uh, for a search for uh, an attorney in a given geography under a given practice area. So proximity, experience in this particular area, uh, we take client review scores into account, we take the ABBA rating into account, a bunch of other factors. And then you call them, so, so here's, there are two levels. One is you have a pool, right? Got it. Which you're recruiting for. Yep. To get in the pool, yep. uh, do people pay? No. All right. Nope. So, and people volunteer or you're sure yeah we have a we have a, a queue and in certain jurisdictions we have greater demand that honestly there's been no shortage of demand from the attorney side for this product yeah uh, attorneys are very interested in, in right. this product but yeah so so yeah we have a queue that you can sign up for and, and then, then you run all the people who are in the pool through some kind of an algorithm to figure out which one you're going to recommend or no they so they bid? this is the way it works so Fair question, great question. Again, happy to talk about my product all day long. Uh, you hit agree and get a call, and what happens is a text message goes out to all of the attorneys in the pool in that geography. Okay. And the first one to respond uh, gets the call. And then just anticipating potentially a question where you're gonna go next, 
We then provide them a third number so that the, neither the consumer nor the lawyer have to use their own personal number. We give them a third number that they can both call into, right, um, that, that allows them to talk. We have no visibility into what happens on that phone call. The only things we know is, are A, that the call happened because we provide the number, B, the duration of the call because it's our number, and C, whether the consumer is happy, and that's because we ask them at the end whether or not they are happy. To uh, rate the lawyer. That exactly. Into the Just like Google. Their rating. Uh, it goes into their advisor rating. Yeah. Um, I don't, I'm not sure, honestly, whether it's calculated into the overall rating. Okay, here. So okay, yeah, lots of, so let me back up. Yeah, I know we have it here too. Student. Yeah, right here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real life student. <laughs> yes. So how does, how does compensation work for this model? Um, is it split between Avo and the, and the attorney? Or yeah. Very good. So, uh, <laughs> fee splitting is not inherently unethical. <laughs> it is only unethical when it has the possibility of influencing. Though this is true, right? Lawyers get totally freaked out about fee splitting. So the answer is yes. No, no, no. Actually, no, no. Uh, the, so, so. Uh, uh, <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, so uh, it's only, but I, I do want to make this point. It's only unethical, and again, this is where, as we begin to think about new models for business for lawyers in the internet age, right, where you could be, where someone like us or any other service or any other network could be facilitating a connection for, between a consumer and a lawyer, right? And the simple fact that there's some monetary gain in the facilitator for that and yeah, we, we don't believe that fee splitting should be on that. Yeah, no, no, fair enough. So, anyway, anyway, okay, fair enough. Anyway, so that's, that's my point. Talk about yeah, 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 fair enough, fair enough. I, again, I'm, 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 I gotta get my, I gotta get my, uh, my leather no, patches. Where is the cone of <laughs> uh, what, so, so, anyway, so operating on that uh, assumption, what we do, though, to be very careful about that and to be very deliberate about it, what we do is we move the entire $40 into the attorney's account uh, once the consumer has indicated that they're satisfied, then in a completely separate transaction, we take ten dollars out of the marketing fee. So you take, you take what is that, twenty percent, twenty-five percent? You take yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a sort of a philosophical. Oh boy. <laughs> He's also a real. Lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a real law student and now a real lawyer. This is awesome. <laughs> But, oh, mean, wow, I'm thank you. I'm a good company because Martha Minow has a 6.5, <laughs> and I have a 7.5. Oh, so that but, means there's some under 8. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess my Thanks question mine. is, thank you. I'm very scared. Very good, very good <laughs> speaking with you. Question, don't you have, I mean, are, is, is this where technology is really dangerous? Because you're saying it's for the benefit of the consumer. But if the consumer doesn't understand the criteria, then are we really helping the consumer? I mean, super lawyers, for example, anybody can be in super lawyers. I mean, in fact, many of us refuse to be in super lawyers because mm -hmm. there have been people in super lawyers who have been indicted. So I guess my question is, are, are you really helping cons the consumer if there's not a real discernible way to determine the credibility of the lawyer you're, you're rating? Uh, so, I think the beauty of what we provide consumers is transparency. But the rating's not transparent. That is the mm -hmm. factor, how the factors are weighed. And, 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 and this is where I think we need to give consumers increasingly, I mean, what we're seeing from an overall marketplace perspective, even outside of legal, is an increasing DIY ethos among consumers, right? Consumers don't only look at the rating and then make a decision. I, d I highly doubt it. In fact, our research has shown that they also look at the client reviews. And they may also look at a few questions that you've answered. They may go to your website and see what information is there. They, believe it or not, may look on social media. They may check LinkedIn. They may check your profile on any other number of, of sites. So I think that a... An, over-reliance on the rating as a sort of influential factor in consumers making a decision is probably not 
a holistic enough picture of how consumers are actually evaluating lawyers, both on our site and more broadly. Yes, over here. Yeah. Then why add the rating? <laughs> <laughs> The goal, again, is where where we started, was it, it, it's not just because it's just because an over reliance is probably not the way to go. It doesn't mean it's not valuable, right? Just because it's not the sole this deciding factor doesn't mean it doesn't come into the, the picture, right? But it's a piece of a variety. I mean, we know that headshots, the the picture that you have of them, has uh, about the same influence in deciding in someone making a decision about who they hire as where you went to law school. Th those are the kinds of, that's the kind of information that we're learning that consumers, now we can argue about whether, and, and, and I get frustrated too because then, then lawyers just roll their eyes and say consumers are stupid, which then I have to go back to David Ogilvy who said the consumer is not a moron, a consumer, and this was sexist at the time, the consumer is your wife, right? Like these are, <laughs> we're all consumers in, in one marketplace or another. So an over-reliance on, uh, or you know, the, the, the rating is a, is a piece of, of the picture. And that just because over-reliance on it would be foolish doesn't mean that it's not valuable in the greater context. So Dan, could you just yes. spend, say a few words about the future, where you guys sure. see yourself going? I'll see if I can get there. Uh, and where are we on time? Okay, we got about 10 minutes. Um, that's both, that's from our that's ad. Your ad. Yeah, so I, I, I wanted to make sure you all went to YouTube and checked it out, right? So now you're totally here. <laughs> Um, the future. Uh, so our mission, we've, we've been around for seven, eight years now, uh, and everything that we've done has been uh, trying to make it easier for consumers to get to choose a lawyer and to get legal advice. And as we move forward, those are exactly the types of things that we're, that we're going to, to be doing. So without... <laughs> Our, you know, our, our product roadmap is a little bit uh, is, is uh, proprietary to yeah. some extent, um, but but I think I think listen, like you can look at all the things that we're doing in the marketplace, and you can begin to get a sense and the things that we've done for the direction that we're headed. Right, we're advertising to consumers on television. We rolled out a product aimed at consumers, Avo Advisor. Right, that's our first really strong consumer facing product. Right, where we're we're monetizing not the, the relationships that we have with lawyers, but the relationships that we have with clients. Uh, and, and moving forward, those are the types of opportunities that, I and mean, we've, we've got uh, over 200,000 lawyers who have claimed their profiles on the site. Um, so there's no one that's even close to having that high of a participation rate among lawyers. We feel like we've got a pretty decent handle on that market. We can always learn more. There's always more that we're doing. But now as we begin to turn we really want to focus more on consumers and helping them get more information, helping them. And, and really, and you've, you've been at these uh, meetings, David. You've, you've heard this stuff. Um, the traditional legal services delivery model, I frequently say it's broken. But to be generous, it's really being called into question by a lot of different forces that we're seeing in the market. Everything from the fact that there's a huge swath of the population that can't afford lawyers, can't even get access to legal services. Um, then when you begin to look at what technology is doing to every type of market, not just legal, but every type of market, and we begin to see consumers who are more DIY focused, who, who, who can self-help in a way and gain access to information in a way that was never possible before. Uh, there's there's an opportunity to hopefully both expand access, um, but also help consumers receive legal services, procure legal services in a way that's more in line with what they want and what they expect. Yeah. Hi, Dan. I'm Fred, and I'm nine point two. <laughs> Hi, Fred. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Yeah. My question has to do with a multi-jurisdictional. Awesome. Uh, has Apple begun to think hard about uh, fields where exemption really makes a difference? Uh, for example, federal communications law, FAA law, immigration law. It's really only um, federal law that counts. And proximity, which seems to be very important in some of your algorithms, 
is pretty much irrelevant. And I'm wondering if you've given any thought to those specialty areas. Sure. Um, the short answer is we're not that sophisticated yet. And, and I do think, I, I still think that, there is, that most consumers, despite all of the changes that we're seeing in the way in which they are, consumers are evolving, I still think there's a legitimate interest in connecting a consumer with a lawyer who is approximately <coughs> close to them. Maybe they want that, uh, that human touch. Maybe, maybe they, they need them to make an appearance. Right, a, a physical appearance at some kind of a hearing or, or in court or something. Um, so I, I think there's still value in, in considering that. Uh, I love, I mean, do we, stepping sort of completely into a different realm, uh, the time to explore multi-jurisdictional practice and to really think deeply about the barriers that exist between states and the ability to practice across state boundaries is way past overdue. Uh, and, and so I, I absolutely think that beginning, and, and, and federal practice areas is a, is a great place to start. Uh, I absolutely think that, that, uh, those, that, that the time to think about multi-jurisdictional practice has absolutely come. Um, but no, it's not something that we're we're thinking about right now, at, you know, at the moment. But I mean, I would say too. Uh, I'll give you this one thought. Yeah, yeah. I live in Massachusetts. I'm not a member of the bar here. I'm a member of the bar in two other jurisdictions. I have no clients from Massachusetts, and in the last 25 years, I've had one. My practice is entirely a federal practice, entirely. Local. While it is just beginning to rise on your radar, it's my whole life. I just give you that. Thought. No, 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 and it's it's not just beginning to rise on our radar. It's it's just that uh, as we've scaled up, it's been easier to think about proximity as a fa as an important factor. But I would also say too. I mean, and this is an aside, but like. Um, Avo can be a piece of your marketing puzzle, right? Like, if, if you have an, a nationwide immigration practice, you may not need us to market, right? You can, you can go after clients in a whole bunch of different ways that we may not necessarily facilitate or enable. Um, but I, I completely Well, agree. in that respect, I know something about the way your system works because I watched my rating climb as I did more national speaking and national publications in Technical journals, not in law. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Maybe you just measure the length of the list of articles. Yeah. So, and I want to make sure, Michelle. Do we? I don't know if someone's going to be here in one. Question. Okay. Yeah. So, Fred, go ahead. This may be easy for somebody who will never be in the system of being practiced in the U.S. But, uh, <laughs> we mean, may we may come to Canada. <laughs> um, I do want to rewind to the sort of why have the discussion we're having. Sure. So we sure. To try to run there too. I think there is something here. I mean, You've got a lot on the go, you've got a lot to plan and whatnot. But what I certainly like about this is it communicates with clients in a way that's familiar. Right? These kinds of ratings exist for everything else in your life. Right? <coughs> and I think that's one of the important things that we need to get over in the practice of law is how do we make it familiar and accessible? So even though you've got some work to do perhaps to refine and then they, they give you a lot to think about, I'm sure, um, I think it's a step in the right direction. You see the progress that we see with this. Yeah, no, I mean, the whole reason that the company started was our, our CEO, who's an attorney himself, uh, a corporate attorney by training, never, never did consumer law. He was on a sabbatical in Italy. This is back in 2004, 2005. And he kept getting phone calls and emails from folks on this, in the States asking him for referrals to family law attorneys, <laughs> immigration. And, and he's, he, he's trying to figure out why half a world away they're reaching out to him for referrals in practice areas that he has absolutely no insight into. He wouldn't know the first thing about where to find a family law lawyer. So think, and, and that's really the, the, the kind of germ of where we began, which is how can we make this experience easier for consumers? How can we make it more meaningful? How can we make it more valuable? And to answer Professor Wilkins' question going forward, 
that's what we want to continue to try to do. So um, thank you so much for that, Dan. Yeah. Um, we, uh, David and I, Nishish, Nanda, and John Coates worked on a project a few years ago where we interviewed all the general counsels of S&P 500 corporations and about how they choose lawyers. And other than the relationship already existing, it is to ask someone that you really trust um, to provide a recommendation. So hats off to your founder to try and tap into that need. And we are looking forward to seeing more and more from, from Avo in terms of the different types of products you provide. And um, really, really thankful that you let us question you. Um, and it's okay that we all don't have the answers, but the questions that mean that there's growth and change and we really, really appreciate you sharing so much of what you know about what's going on and about your company, so thank you. Sure, and uh, if folks want to be in touch with me, please uh, send me an email. I, if, if, if I didn't answer a question well enough, I absolutely want to do the best I can to, to give you more information and help you understand what we do, so like, don't hesitate to be in touch.